I will do the trial. Natalie, did you do uh, Well, I hope you good luck and. Are there any other questions to be taken down? No. Okay, well, we do have one question for Dr. Hamner. What has been your experience with validating non-animal methods? Example, easy to do, are there many roadblocks, et cetera? Well, I think that <clears throat> the whole business of using non-animal uh, testing models and so forth has been held back by a whole bunch of of uh, normal things. We, we didn't have the technology. Uh, it's difficult to change things. Uh, certain groups of the industry doesn't want to change because they understand the current rules and just keep doing over and over what they know how to do. Uh, but uh, the biggest problem is going to be to be able to develop a a uh, differential test that really gives you good information about changing in the cell's profile, either synthetic or metabolic, and then say that this is as good or better information than, say, two-year rat studies or something of that nature. And so we've got to go through this period where we kind of run dual uh, assessments. We run the new tests that are molecular biology-based, and the old test and show that we get better information quicker from the new one. So that's very little experience up until now because the technology didn't allow that. And now it's going to take us five, ten years to go through this dual system where we validate that the new system is better, quicker, cheaper than the old system. And so those kinds of transitions take a long time. The other thing it is that the industry, I mean, the uh, uh, regulatory agency scientists aren't up to snuff on leading edge technologies, and they don't quite understand these technologies. So they have to go and be trained and to understand them so they can apply them to the regulatory framework. So there's a whole host of things. This is not an easy road or a quick road. If it was, somebody had already done it. Mm -hmm. But it's a road that uh, has a lot of promise, and it's a road that's realistic in today's technological uh, abilities, capabilities. And Justice Bastarash, I understand that you have a little update to give on the case. Of well, all I wanted to say is that the, the little... Uh, aftermath of uh, the decision in Monsanto is that now a group of uh, farmers are suing Monsanto in nuisance and negligence, <laughs> asking for an order that uh, <laughs> Monsanto clear their land of all unwarranted uh, canola and to get damages for uh, having de been deprived of the use of, of their land. Uh, I did also want to tell you uh, just one little thing about our court. We've been very concerned in the last few years about the lack of uh, knowledge of judges in dealing with these scientific issues. And uh, before the Harvard Law case, we organized a session, an information session with scientists who came to our court for a day to explain all of the science independently of the parties uh, before we uh, dealt with the case. And actually, since then, we've had a few other sessions of that kind. Another one with scientists. There uh, were 10 scientists from six different countries who were uh, meeting in Montreal. And we brought them to Ottawa to meet with our court for a day to talk about nanoscience. We wanted to know what it was and uh, get, uh, I guess, more uh, information on our own, even though we don't have a case that deals with that. But it's sort of a a trend now that we're trying to uh, better our own education in, in this field to be able to deal 
uh, in a more effective way with these difficult cases. So this so is what I wanted to tell you. So these multidisciplinary conferences are taking hold, it seems, and hopefully we're going to see a lot more of these in the future. Let me, uh, may I hone in and, and back? I have a coincidental kind of uh, thing about all of this. Uh, back in 1989, I headed up a study commission for the state of North Carolina to develop the Genetic Engineering Review uh, Board and the Genetic, Engineer, uh, Genetic Organisms Release Act. And that was the first state to have uh, release activity of, or laws and rules about releasing uh, genetically engineered plants into the environment. And uh, so we set up the Genetic Engineering Review Board, but we, to do that, you had to run it through three committees of the, uh, <clears throat> of the uh, state legislature. And so we developed the, ru we developed the uh, rules, and then we developed the regulations simultaneously. So we wrote both for the, gen <clears throat> for the Genetic Engineering Organisms Act. We wrote both the rules and the regulations and carry them all to the, <clears throat> to the legislature at the same time. So there'll be no ambiguity <clears throat> about what the rules are going to say and what the regulations are going to say. And we ran that through <clears throat> uh, three committees without a dissenting vote. But the only uh, uh, objecting company in the world was Man Monsanto. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more questions for our guest Thank speakers? You. Thank you. Good afternoon. We have three distinguished speakers for future prospects of law and regulation, our final panel session that takes a forward-looking view of prospects for the future evolution of animal law in the United States. And in addressing this issue, let's just think back for a moment to where things have, have gone over the past 400 years. Of course, we just saw at Jamestown the 400th anniversary of the founding of uh, what became the state of Virginia. If you were to go back and look at the law codes of early Jamestown or of Massachusetts Bay and Marblehead or New Netherland, as I have done, what you would see is that some of the very first laws put on the books dealt with animals because of the conflict of the interests involved of the people of those colonies. The first laws actually relating to animals prohibited pigs and cattle from being allowed to roam unrestrained by gates and fences. And why? Because in earliest America, there was a conflict between the Indians, the Native Americans, who raised their corn in unfenced fields, and the new colonists, whose pigs and cattle would roam freely, get into those fields, root up the corn, trample down the corn, leading to conflicts uh, often resolved violently between the Native Americans and the early colonists. And so some of the very first laws in this country dealt with animals. Think how much the law has evolved to the discussions you heard earlier today in the course of the past 400 years. These three speakers will begin to address the ways in which the law is likely to evolve in the next century, and I think that they've got some good things to, to say to you. First of all, Stephen Wise, former president of the Animal Legal Defense Fund and an accomplished author, uh, most recently uh, in 2005 for the book, uh, 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 However, uh, Though the Heavens May Fall, which tells the story similar to the film Amistad, if anyone has seen that, of the 1772 trial uh, in England of a man uh, uh, involving a trial of an African-American man who was on his way 
to the Caribbean to be sold into slavery, and the story of his trial actually helped to create the abolitionist movement in England, uh, and uh, Mr. Wise has actually written about that. He also, of course, wrote the important book, Rattling the Cage, in 2000, which discussed a similar type of battle, and that in which he made the argument that legal rights applicable to humans should also be applicable to protect the uh, rights and to avoid pain for chimpanzees and bonobos. So what we have is a gentleman who's been in the forefront of forward-looking thinking with respect to animal rights, Stephen M. Wise. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I was uh, pleased to... Uh, to hear about the founding of Jamestown because that's about where I'm starting as well. Um, first of all, I, <clears throat> I just want to explain that uh, uh, for those who come, who are those of you who come near me, I, I actually do do stink, and uh, uh, the reason is is that uh, I'm writing a book about uh, factory farming and concentrating in Bladen County, and uh, I was in Bladen County this morning on a hog farm, and uh, uh, the hog farm was kind enough to show me and my wife around, and we just didn't think he, she was going to going to do it today. So at nine o'clock, we had an appointment uh, with him. We went through the hog farm, and uh, then we got in our car and drove as fast as we could uh, to uh, Duke. So I just uh, look and smell like your average person who's on a hog farm. So, <laughs> well, in, in in fact, what 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 I was also doing there, uh, not only looking at at uh, hog farms at factory farming, but yesterday I spent the day uh, interviewing slaughterhouse workers because, as, as you may know, uh, Tar Heel uh, has the largest slaughterhouse in the world. It, uh, it kills uh, 38,000 pigs every single day. It, uh, it's an extraordinary number of, of pigs who are killed there. And so I've been uh, uh, out and about that slaughterhouse now for twice. This is my second visit down uh, to there. And when I learned that the conference was at, this conference was at Duke, and it was about biotechnology, the genetic manipulation of animals, uh, I, I thought that North Carolina was actually an interesting place to, to have that sort of a conference and talk about that sort of a thing, uh, because uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the genetic manipulation of animals, and in fact, obviously, it, 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 it's a subset of the way in which we treat them generally. And North Carolina and Bladen County, and once I believe this was either on the very edge or part of Bladen County, almost half of, half of Carolina was, North Carolina was once Bladen County, that uh, um, it, North Carolina has a history of uh, what, ha what you can look at it and understand what happens when one set of people treat another set of beings, either animals or non, or either human animals or non-human animals, uh, as, as things, as beings who, who don't have rights and, and which you can do whatever you want with them. And that's why I, I was interested to hear about, the, about Jamestown, because about 50 years after the founding of Jamestown, the first settlers came to North Carolina. And the, at, at that time, there were about uh, 50,000 Native American Indians here in about 25 tribes. They spoke three language groups, and they were scattered all over the state. And you know, within decades of that time, those Indians were decimated. And as a result of disease, of genocide, of warfare, and in fact, the Lumbee tribe today is, is really, the, or has been for 200 years, kind of the remnants of the, of the scattered Indians who, of, of, of the uh, who, who came from all kinds of tribes and came together to form what we would call the Lumbee tribe today. And in fact, the Cherokees from North Carolina is, are very famous because of the Trail of Tears. And they were in the middle of the 19th century. They, we, we actually sent them packing to Oklahoma, and, and in which thousands of them, in which many of them died, and they were sent away from their mountains. And it was done only for one reason. All of these things were done for one reason, because the people coming into North Carolina wanted their land. They wanted their resources. And they thought they could do with the Indians as they wanted. And they did that all over the United States, all over the Western Hemisphere. But, but, but I, I thought since we were here in North Carolina, I would just mention that. Then, interestingly here, what occurred as, as well all, all over the Southeast is that the Indians, even though they were the focus of such terrible things, ended up turning around and slaughtering their deer. 
They did that because the Europeans wanted the deer hides for v various reasons, book, book coverings, horse accessories, clothing, both here and in, in, and in Europe. And there was a terrible slaughter that the Indi over a century that, that the Indians of North Carolina and the South, Southeast perpetrated upon the white-tailed deer, similar to what happened in the North, where they went after the beavers, almost drove the beaver into extinction, and, and, and in the West, where the same thing happened because of the buffalo. And the, then the, the, there was a, a, a third kind of great slaughter that occurred in, or n not a great slaughter, but kind of a, a bad thing that occurred here, which was black chattel slavery. And in fact, here you have the, the uh, case of state versus man is one of the famous uh, pro-slavery cases by the North Carolina C Supreme Court, in which they, they explain that the purpose of slavery is not for the slave. In fact, they don't want the slave to even be happy. They want the slave to obey perfectly, always perfectly, they, because the whole purpose of enslaving a thing is, as the North Carolina Supreme Court said, is for the profit and the purpose of the master. And so here you have three you know, terrible, terrible events. You have the, uh, the slaughter and the deportation of the Indians. You have the slaughter of the, of the white-tailed deer. You have the, um, you have the enslavement of black Africans all for one purpose, to, to the profit and whatever other reason they might want of the people who are doing that. And so, and, and they all, by the way, thought that they were truly good people. I've never, they, they just thought they were. The people who slaughtered the Indians thought that that was the proper thing to do. When the Indians slaughtered the deer, they thought that was the proper thing to do. And of course, the people who enslaved blacks thought that that was the proper thing to do. And probably, coincidentally, but maybe not, they looked to the Bible oftentimes in, in, in order to, um, to give them the rationale for what they were doing, especially the book of Genesis. Now, what I, I think these three things tend to show and should cause us to act in very cautious ways is when we decide that we are going to exploit the weak and the helpless for our own benefits because we can see that others have done that in North Carolina. They've done it repeatedly. And when we look at what they did, we think that what they did was morally wrong. And it should have been legally wrong, but it was not. And the legal system has always walked hand in hand with the theologies, the sociologies, the psychologies of the people who are doing the exploitation. And when there are no barriers, when there are no legal barriers or ethical barriers, uh, religious barriers. Now, the Indians did have religious barriers to the slaughter of the deer, but the dissolution of them, the, uh, the realization that their religion simply didn't work anymore, uh, caused them to discard that, and that allowed them to begin slaughtering the deer. They hadn't done that. They had lived with the deer for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, but with it, decades of the time that the Europeans came, the Indians began to slaughter the deer almost to complete annihilation. And so the law, when, when, when the law permits the exploitation of the weak and helpless, then they are ruthlessly exploited. And in legal terms now, and probably then too as well, the the reason that the law allows us to do that is because, is because we view them as things. We view, them, we view ourselves as persons. Now, in the law, persons are, are entities who are made for themselves. So we, we here are all seen as legal persons. But things are seen to exist for only one purpose, and that is for the purpose of persons. So when, the, when you classify a thing, a, 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 an entity, a being as a legal thing, what you're saying is that the purpose of that legal thing is to serve the legal person. Then you might decide that you want to protect that legal thing for some reason, oftentimes so it'll reproduce or to do something else that will help those of us, excuse me, who are exploiting them. But the problem is, is that uh, as the, as 
lawyers would note, that we have an extreme conflict of interest. When there, when there is a being who exists in law solely for us, then we have a conflict of interest when we are trying to decide how that being should be treated. Because the being is going to be treated in ways that are going to help us and not going to help them. And this can be exacerbated in two ways. One is that the more you're convinced that exploiting that being is going to help us, then the greater of conflict of interest you have. Because you're positive that if you treat that being in, 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 a, in a way that exploits them, but is going to have good consequences for us, well, that's a good thing. Because they are things, and we are persons. They exist for us. They exist for our con convenience. And there's a uh, quote that I have, a brief quote. It's by Patrick Henry. And Patrick Henry in 1773 talked about his slaves. He had slaves. And he said, would anyone believe that I'm master of a slave of my own purchase? I'm drawn along by the general inconveniency of living without them. He understood that it was probably wrong for him to have slaves. He said, I will not, I cannot justify it, however culpable my conduct. He understood that what he was doing was wrong. But slaves were so damn convenient. And everyone, who we, every entity whom we exploit, it's really damn convenient for us to do it. And that's why we do it. And we have a conflict of interest in trying to decide what, where the lines are going to be drawn with respect to the, the uh, degree of our, of our exploitation. Now, much of the work that I've done over the last 10 years has been to try to look forward, just as, as, as was, was said, how do we deal with this? How do we stop this kind of ruthless exploitation of non-human animals who are legal things? And the way we do it, I have been proposing, is that we look to see how human beings have been protected. And human beings have been primarily protected by being taken out of the category of legal things, as black slaves were, as sometimes women were, as sometimes children were, taken out of the category of, of legal things and put into the category of legal persons, because then they become visible to the law. One of the metaphors that I've used is, is, is the idea that uh, when James Somerset, who was the slave about whom I wrote in though the heavens may fall, when, when he was, he didn't want to be a slave. But the problem was is that when you're a slave, you're a thing, you're essentially invisible to the civil law. And there's always a problem at, as to how you deal with it. What happens if you say, but there's a mistake made here. I should not be a slave. Or well, you shouldn't even have slaves. How does the slave come to a court to complain about that? It's very difficult to do. And in fact, if you look at the reporters in the southern states up to the time of the Civil War, many slaves attempted to do that and they were unsuccessful because judges could not see them. They were invisible because they were persons. I'm sorry, they were not persons. They were things. They couldn't even go to court and say they shouldn't be things because they were things. There were some statutes that were passed to protect whites who were mistakenly uh, in, enslaved and, and, and black slaves could sometimes use it, but they, were not, they, they weren't very common. What James Somerset did was use a common law writ of habeas corpus. And that's what the book talks about. How did a man use a writ, how did he use the common law writ of habeas corpus to be able to have his lawyer stand in front of Lord Mansfield and say that he shouldn't be a slave? Now, Lord Mansfield could have done what the Supreme Courts of many of the southern states did before the Civil War and say, I'm sorry, you're invisible. You can't even claim that you ought to be visible. But he didn't. And that's one of the reasons why I think he was one of the greatest English-speaking judges ever. And, and what he did was then say, yes, you, you, you are permitted to bring your writ of habeas corpus in front of me, and it, it's re a writ of habeas corpus is really the procedural vehicle that someone then can use to bring their substantive claims into court. It makes them visible. It makes them visible. So that's the story of how James Somerset became visible. And when he, when he was able to make his substantive arguments to the Court of King's Bench, he won. 
and he walked out of that courtroom a free man. He was no longer a slave. And as I said in the book title, it's the beginning of the end of human slavery. Well, that title was, especially the subtitle was, was mine because, and it is not for sale outside. So, <laughs> thank you. So, it, it, it was the beginning of the end of human slavery. And I wanted my publisher to make sure they put that in because that it is. Human slavery, at least formally, is gone. But there's non-human slavery, and that is here in spades. And I wanted to make sure that people understood, if they understood at all, that I was talking about the beginning of the end of human slavery, not non-human slavery. Now, I actually wrote another law review article, which I can show you here, in the Golden Gate Law Review that came out in January. And it is entitled, uh, The Entitlement of Chimpanzees to the Common Law Writs of Habeas Corpus and De Homine Replegiando. And, I'm sh and I won't even bother with the second one. Uh, it's a very ancient writ. It hasn't been used in the US for about 130 years. Right. But it was used a long, long time before that in England. And I argue that chimpanzees and other non-human animals can also use the writ of habeas corpus the way James Somerset did, because James Somerset's writ of habeas corpus case, which is very famous, is law in North Carolina, and is law in almost all the other 50 states, 49 states. And so it can be used in the same way James Somerset did. Now, when you use, if you can use the writ of habeas corpus or the writ of de homine replegiando, which is replevin of the person, as opposed to replevin of the thing, when you use that, then what sort of arguments then can you make to a court? And in rattling, now you may hold that up. Uh. Rattling the cage, please. In, <laughs> in rattling the cage or the second book, draw, drawing the line, that's not for sale either, I'm sorry. Um, when, when you, when you uh, both of those books talk about what sort of substantive arguments can be used in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, in the next 40 years that will allow uh, us to to bring the important claims that at least some non-human animals should no longer be treated as, as, as things, but sh should be treated as persons. And about, do I have five minutes? I don't five know how long. Five minutes, that's all I needed. OK. In five minutes, I will explain to you what I've been doing, thinking about for the last 15 years. And, <laughs> and it, it goes like this, that uh, uh, one of the, of the most important values in the West is the idea of autonomy, and that judges will tend to, and, and every single word I say, I have about 10 pages I speak about in some of the books. So every, a, a judge who believes that a being is autonomous will have a great respect for that being. And, it's, and they will generally view them as persons, not things. And so the smallest kind of autonomy, I argue, that would allow a tripwire for, that, for, for, a, for a, a judge to begin to view them as persons and not things is what I call practical autonomy. And so that's where you bring in the science. The scientific issue then is at what point are beings autonomous to have, to have the amount of autonomy that you need to act as a tripwire to be able to be, to be declared a person and not a thing. And I argue that, that um, if you, number one, uh, can want something, if, you, if you're cognitively complicated enough to want something, you're cognitively complicated enough to be able to act intentionally to get that, to, and if you're cognitively complex enough so that you have some sort of a sense of self, and that alone can fill library shelves as to what a sense of self is, but if you, ha if you have some sort of a sense of self so that what happens to you matters to you, if you have those three things, then you have what's called practical autonomy. And I argue that that is sufficient, at least sufficient, to warrant having certain basic fundamental rights be bestowed upon you. And in Drawing the Line, which was the second book which I did not bring to hold up, you, you, there is a, a little chart at the end. And in there, I, I um, talked about six or seven species of animals or six or seven specific individual animals and showed where you might go on this scale of practical autonomy. And I, I had uh, one, two, three, four categories. And category uh, one were those animals who are so cognitively complex. And Washoe, who just died in the last week, is, 
is an example of a chimpanzee who is so cognitively complex that she should be in category one. I mean, she has, she's conscious, she's self-conscious, she can use language, she can produce it, she can understand it, she probably has a theory of mind. In other words, she knows what's going on in her mind, but she can know what's going on in your mind the way you know what's going on in my mind now. Uh, she can deceive, she, can, she has all sorts of complicated cognitive abilities. And all of the great apes should go in that category, and probably some of the dolphins and whales as well. And then on, on the other hand, you have category four, which is all those animals who we, who, uh, we think uh, probably don't have anything that remotely comes close to practical autonomy, and they would not be entitled to rights, at least under the practical autonomy theory. Then there's the third category, which is those animals that we don't know enough about to be able to make any kind of a reasonable guess as to what their cognition is, which is probably most of the animals because we haven't studied them. The second category is where I put, is, is kind of a uh, sliding scale as we move up towards the apes and the, or sideways to the apes and to the dolphins and whales, elephants, African gray parrots, um, animals who, who are, display extraordinarily complex characteristics, but for one reason or another, they don't quite make it to the point, to the cognitive complexity of whales and and, and, and apes, and they, they might be that cognitively complex, but the problem is, is that we don't know it. And, it's, and the, the problem that we generally have is that it's very difficult to know whether a being uh, ha uh, has a sense of self, because they can't speak to us in ways in which we understand unless we teach them to do it, and some of them we have. Uh, and so it's very hard to tell what they're thinking. If you've ever, ever had a one-year-old child or a two-year-old child, you know it's very hard to understand what they're thinking and what kind of cognitive abilities they actually have. Uh, so in, that was the, um, that was the um, 15 years of thinking uh, <laughs> compressed to five minutes. And so, uh, so in short, when we are, my one-minute wrap-up, we, we understand, when, when we, are exploiting those who are helpless, as we have done so many times in our history. Yeah. And we're doing now with non-human animals, genetically Senior. manipulating them, Not biomedical that. research laboratories, on factory farms, and in so many ways I can't even, I can't even take the time to explain it to you, that we need to look, look back and say, why are we doing this? What's happened when we thought that way about other beings? Uh, what kind of creatures are they? Are they entitled to be free from our exploitation uh, because they're, they are so complex and we need to simply leave them alone? Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jeannie Perrin. Uh, note Perrin, not uh, pronounced the way of a former uh, First Lady of Argentina. Uh, and uh, she is a practicing attorney with real world experience dealing with, amongst other things, disputes between parties involved in the importation of animal products. Uh, she has uh, been active in various proceedings, including administrative proceedings in Washington, D.C., involving the uh, Department of Agriculture, and brings a real world attorney in the trenches of litigation and regulation uh, worldview to share with you today. Uh, and she will be addressing the topic, do we need more regulation? Ms. Perrin. Thank you, and I'll also add to my bio, as I do when it's not brought out, that I'm a veterinarian. So those of you who are veterinarians in the, office, uh, in the audience can actually like me, because I'm not just a lawyer. Um, I got burned out after seven years of being a lawyer, and instead of going back to school to be a pastry chef, which I sort of think now would have been a better idea, I went back to school to be a veterinarian. And so I did both for a while, and, um, and I practice. I have a wide practice in animal law, including animal food and drug law, animal welfare Fair act issues, importation, that sort of thing. And I have been fortunate enough to work with wonderful people at USDA like Dr. Golden Tire um, on behalf of a, a number of clients. I, I try to help people comply with the Animal Welfare Act. And for those of you that aren't 
that familiar with research institutions, let me assure you that research institutions, at least my clients, try very hard to comply with the Animal Welfare Act. Um, there's been a lot of talk, and I'll talk a little bit later about the act and the fact that what it does and doesn't cover. Most of my clients who do research on um, mice of the species, mus, rodents of the species, ratus, and purpose-bred birds used for research that are not covered by the act today, apply all of the features of the act to those animals as well because they ethically feel that they should. So that should, I, I hope to send you home with some comfort level on, on that score. And I hope I can work this. Yay. Okay. Um, before we talk about should there be new regulation, what I thought I would try to do in a non-boring way, I hope, is to sort of capsulize for everybody what we've been talking about for two days, what we have now, what, what is covered by what, what is covered by what agency, and it's complex. It's taken me the last 10 years to figure this out because I've been a food and drug and USDA lawyer for that long. Um, and as you'll see as I go through my slides, um, <laughs> who regulates what when is, is, is uh, challenging to figure out. As we've discussed, for transgenic animals to be used for food, for pharmacogenomics, uh, for tr xenotransplantation, for lots of other big words that are hard to pronounce, the um, CVM, the Center for Veterinary Medicine at FDA, and uh, who is ably represented by Larissa, um, has, taken, has, has told us that they're going to take jurisdiction over those animals. It's an interesting paradigm to apply a drug model to an animal, but um, the, the way CVM regulates new drug regulation is very, very onerous, and I mean that in a good way. You really have to jump through hoops and you really have to prove to the agency that your new drug is safe before it can be approved. So to apply that paradigm to, um, to animals is about the most restrictive paradigm that I can think of in terms of is a transgenic animal going to be safe? And CVM has stepped up to the plate and said it's going to do that. Now, there are a lot of other centers that may become involved depending on what the, the product turns out to be. Um, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR as we uh, food and drug lawyers call it, regulates human drugs. So if the product of a transgenic animal is, is a human drug, then that center would take jurisdiction over that drug. CVM may still have jurisdiction over the animal, but CEDAR would have jurisdiction over the drug. CIFSAN, the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, may have jurisdiction over, over a product that's human food. This is a little bit in flux. Um, CVM is still sort of trying to figure out whether it's going to maintain jurisdiction over things like that transgenic salmon that we heard about. If the product is something like milk or shell eggs, however, one might argue that that's far enough removed from the original animal that it should, that that, that product should be under SIFSAN jurisdiction. So we're going to have to see how that shakes out. Um, the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, um, CDRH, if the product qualifies as a medical device. The Center for, the FDA Center for uh, Biologics Evaluation and Research, CBER, there's a lot of FDA centers over there. Uh, if the product qualifies as a biologic for human beings, that center has jurisdiction over biologics for human beings. If the product is for use in animals, if it's an animal drug or an animal feed, then you stay with CVM because they control all animal drugs and animal feeds. Now, interestingly, for historical reasons that Dr. Goldentire may be able to explain to me, but I sure can't, um, the regulation of animal biologics isn't in FDA at all, even though human biologics is. It's over in USDA. And while we all love APHIS and USDA, I don't know why it's there, but it is. So if the product turns out to be a biologic, like a vaccine, for example, for use in animals, USDA regulates it. Are you getting the idea about why it took me 10 years to figure all this out? <laughs> Okay, USDA also monitors, in addition to its Animal Welfare Act uh, monitoring, it also an monitors animal health, like herd health. So it gets very involved when you're talking about diseases like bovine spongiform encephalopathy, uh, or BSE, which is also mad cow disease. So 
They, USDA APHIS, the same agency that does the Animal Welfare Act, also regulates herd health in the United States and therefore regulates things like importation of animal-derived stuff because it may implicate herd health in the United States. The first BSE cow that we had in the U.S. came from, and I apologize to the Canadians, Canada. So that was an imported cow. So obviously imported products can affect animal health in the United States. State veterinarian, state animal health departments also regulate animal health, herd health. So for example, every state will have um, jurisdiction for certain, or I'm sorry, will have um, a, a status for certain disease let, diseases of herds like tuberculosis. Um, and so the state veterinarian will get very involved in the control of the disease from that standpoint. Okay, you ready? Here's where it gets really complicated. If that wasn't bad enough. If you are a cow, a sheep, a pig, or a goat, and you're to be used for human food, when you're growing up and you're out in the field, if you got a disease, APHIS controls you, but otherwise, if drugs are being used on you, for example, FDA controls you, but the minute that you enter the slaughterhouse and you're to be used for human food, then you're under the jurisdiction of APHIS under the Meat Inspection Act. But some of the food products you get made into are under FDA jurisdiction. Gives you a headache after a while. Okay. If you're a domesticated bird, a chicken or a turkey, again, when you're growing up, you're under FDA jurisdiction, but when you're in the, in the processing plant, you're under the Poultry Products Inspection Act, which again is monitored by USDA. If, however, you're not a cow, you're a bison, or a deer, or a pheasant, or something like that, then you're under FDA jurisdiction all the way through, soup to nuts, as it were. If you're a fish, fresh or salt water, again, you're under FDA jurisdiction. So we have a whole lot of agencies here taking a whole lot of jurisdiction already over animals and what we do with them. Uh, I love this one. If you're a shell egg, so you're an egg still in the shell of a domesticated chicken, turkey, etc., you're under FDA jurisdiction, but as soon as somebody breaks that shell and does something with you, you're under USDA jurisdiction. Under the Egg Products Inspection Act, okay? And as I've been telling you, FDA regulates Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and the Food Safety Inspection Service of USDA, not APHIS, but a sister service, regulates all the other acts I've just been talking about. Okay, and as we've argued about it, the AWA covers animals used in research except mice of the species must, um, Rat, rats of the species, ratus, and purpose-bred birds. But all other warm-blooded animals used in research are regulated by the Animal Welfare Act. Let me just step back and take an aside here. Again, to give you some comfort level, USDA has teeth. I spend a lot of time defending companies against USDA enforcement actions because they're entitled to a defense as companies in the United States. And yes, as Dr. Reppy correctly said, today each violation is $3,750. That's per violation per day per animal. That's teeth. I settled the case on behalf of a large university in California for a year and a half ago for $97,000. That was a settlement amount. USDA has teeth, and it enforces the Animal Welfare Act. Okay, so what does the AWA cover? Um, and, and I'm focusing mostly on experiments. It covers exhibitors, it covers dealers, but uh, experimental animals. So the design and the conduct of experiments, personnel qualification, veterinary care, animal ID, record keeping, inspection reporting, as I said, enforcement, housing, feeding and watering, temperature, exercise requirements, care and, and transit, cleaning and sanitation. There are specific rules for species. There are specific regulations that, covering how, uh, that cover how you have to house, feed, exercise, etc. Dogs and cats, guinea pigs and hamsters, rabbits, non-human primates, marine mammals, and then there's a catch-all for everybody else. And you can argue whether or not that's sufficient, but it's certainly quite a bit of regulation. Okay, there's also what um, Dr. Ruiz Bravo was talking about at lunch yesterday, which is O-Law, the Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare at the NIH. So if you have federal funding under the Public Health Service Act, O-Law regulates you, 
and they provide oversight. Most of my clients who have research facilities are also um, accredited by the Association for Assessment and Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care International, or ALAC. ALAC conducts very thorough, very difficult to pass inspections before it, it will certify a facility and before it will renew the certification. We have a lot of regulation. Again, you can argue about whether it's currently sufficient to cover animals, but by God, we have a lot of it today. So before we start thinking in a knee-jerk fashion about more regulation, we need to recognize what we already have. And how does that impact the people who are regulated? Well, because these are regulated entities and because the enforcement from USDA is, is so strenuous and because of the fallout that research facilities get in this day and age if they are cited under the Animal Welfare Act, people try mightily to comply with the Animal Welfare Act. Right now, the IACUC, which you heard about, the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, requires a tremendous amount of information in, it, certainly in large institutions before they'll approve a protocol. I have seen IACUC standard forms for protocols that are 40 pages long that the researchers have to fill in every conceivable detail. Um, and I'm not criticizing it, I'm just saying that that's that institution's way of trying to comply with the act. Uh, there can be frequent IACUC meetings. I have clients where the IACUC's meeting every two weeks. Um, there, for even minor protocol changes, you have to go through the IACUC. I mean, even things that one would think would be in, within the discretion of a veterinarian. Many institutions require IACUC approval because they believe that that's what they need to do to comply with the act. And that's great for my business because I'm getting a lot more people consulting me about their IACUCs and their procedures. And there are other consultants out there that will review IACUCs and procedures um, so that to help people try to comply with the act. This is a, a British researcher. This is one guy in one quote, and I know that, but it really caught my eye because I was thinking about this speech. Constant policing of our research makes us look sinister, says scientists. This was in the London Times about two weeks ago. Um, and this, this one particular researcher said, 40% of my research grants went in administration and compliance. And we heard this morning from the, the nephrologist that spoke to us, 30% of his time is spent on these sorts of issues. So I'm not criticizing and I'm not saying it's too much. I'm just saying that there's a lot of regulation already in place. And we require an awful lot of our research, uh, researchers before we'll let them experiment on animals. And then in addition, USDA also codifies new regulations periodically when it believes or proposes them when it, it believes that they make sense. And I don't know if Dr. Goldentire can tell me if we're ever going to see these things in final form, because they've been pending for a while. But right now, um, there is a proposal for medical records that would tell you exactly what you should have in your medical records. This is really already in USDA policy, and people are, are already complying with it, but they're trying to put it into a final regulation that came out in, I don't remember, 2004 or something like that, and it's still sitting there. Um, there were also specific standards proposed for ferrets on the theory, apparently, that, that they were different enough from the catch-all that they needed specific standards, which is reasonable. And for the mice, rats, and birds that are covered, because some are under the Animal Welfare Act, um, there was a, a, a proposal for a regulation to cover that as well. So USDA does come out with new regulations periodically when the need presents itself. So I raise the question. I'm actually not trying to answer it because I'm not prescient enough to answer it, but I raise the question. Do we need more? We have an awful lot, and we have to recognize what we already have. So let's just think about a couple of scenarios here. If the transgenic animal would be covered by the Animal Welfare Act, so if it's an animal that would be used in research or an exhibited animal or something like that, well, at least these areas are already covered. Veterinary care, protocol approval, personnel, record keeping, reporting, inspection, and enforcement. So at least the animal's already covered in those areas. So you have to look at whether that would be sufficient or not. It's likely, I think, that for most transgenic animals, 
the housing and the husband, husbandry standards that are already in place for the same species, assuming that the transgenic animal is within the same species. But it, it, it seems to me likely that those standards would also apply to at least most transgenic animals. And so with respect to that, I think a lot of the transgenic animals will already be covered. Would they all? I don't know. I, it depends on you know what you do to the animal, obviously, but certainly we have to bear in mind that a lot of what we've already got would cover these animals. And then if different husbandry or, uh, or standards is needed, as we just saw, USDA does come out with new regulations periodically. So presumably um, you, could, you could come out with a regulation for that that wouldn't, be, uh, that wouldn't take too much in terms of administra administrative time, administrative resources to cover that if you needed it. As I said earlier, by classifying transgenic animals as new animal drugs, which, you know, we all used to joke about where would you put the label on the cow, and that's still true, but still, to, to classify the animal as a new animal drug, FDA is, is using its most restrictive paradigm. Uh, I represent a lot of companies getting a lot of new animal drugs, I mean real drugs, uh, things that you inject in an animal, for example. And you are talking about a multi-year, multi-million dollar process that takes a tremendous amount of research to show that the product is safe before FDA will approve it. And so, as I said, by applying this to animals, um, FDA, I think, is, is really attempting to get its arms around the safety issue. Depending on the specific situation, obviously FDA can also come out with more regulation to deal with these animals if it in fact does, does take jurisdiction over them. I was talking to Dr. Riley today about really who has jurisdiction because I think USDA is maybe also saying maybe it has jurisdiction over transgenic animals, I don't know. If it stays in FDA's court, I know what the outcome will be, which is that nothing is going to get approved unless FDA can go stand before Congress and say with full confidence that there's no safety issue with respect to this animal. USDA obviously has a different mission and a different paradigm and they do things a little bit differently. So it'd be interesting to see if the USDA takes jurisdiction. But they may, particularly in terms of, um, because USDA deals with disease and infectious disease, if you're talking about, for example, transgenic animal containment, that may end up being more of a USDA issue. So we'll have to see how that comes out. So I don't answer the question. I'm sorry I leave you with the question, but we really need to think about whether it's appropriate to have more regulation and specifically what that regulation would be when we've already got so much. Thank you. Our final panelist is David Favor, and he is a professor of law at Michigan State University whose roots go back here to uh, the, the, the neighborhood of Duke, uh, graduating from the University of Virginia and from the William and Mary School of Law. He too, as our first speaker, uh, is a prolific author, having written books such as uh, uh, Dog Behavior and Animal Law, uh, Animal Law, and the trade in endangered species. Uh, he is uh, an expert in these areas of law, and I will now turn over the podium uh, to David Favor. Thank you. About three weeks ago, I was out of my farm. I have uh, been blessed to be able to buy a farm 10 years ago, and uh, we now share that farm with uh, sheep and chickens and this year turkeys and llamas and goldfish and sort of things. Um, but the sheep are the ones I'm actually most close to and the rams I identify uh, most closely with, as you might imagine. Um, and so I was out talking to them about the fact that I was going to be coming to this, this conference and that we were going to be talking about all these neat genetic techniques and that uh, in vitro fertilization and transgenetic uh, animals and they began to get very alarmed looks on their faces. Um, this was clearly bothering them, but they, they didn't say anything right then. And uh, it wasn't for another day or two that um, Christopher, our, our big alpha male, uh, approached me and uh, suggested that, that the males wish to formally complain uh, and suggest that it would be inappropriate for me to come to this conference uh, because I might pick up 
alternative ways of impregnating the ewes that were on the other side of the fence. <laughs> and they wanted to reiterate the fact that natural reproduction was the way to go. <laughs> and there was no need for genetic manipulation of anybody. They had it all well in hand. Um, I had to assure them that as to their role uh, on my farm, gen uh, natural selection was going to be slightly modified. They didn't get to choose the ewe. We got to choose the ewe that they were going to be with, but that natural breeding was, in fact, going to be the, uh, the method that we were going to do reproduction. Um, when you look at the ram, what is the point of the ram's life to the ram? To mate to make the next generation. That is what they live for. That is the annual cycle. If you time it right, it amounts to about 10 seconds each year. Um, but that's it. They grow, they tussle, they pound each other on the head to get the alpha status to be the animal that's going to breed the next generation. This is their beingness. This is who they are. It's what they do. And until I had them, I, I wouldn't understand that. You have to live with an animal for a while to get to understand it. And they're different than dogs. They don't come up and get in my lap or, or do anything like that. Well, let me shift now. That's my farm thread. My science thread is that my undergraduate degree was in chemistry and that I have been a long supporter of the world of science and the process of science and I'm a very firm believer in the process of science as a way to advance our civilization. The first law review article, substantial law review article I wrote was a defense of scientific investigation as an exercise of the First Amendment under our Constitution. And I still believe it. Um, however, well placed within there is that that doesn't mean that society doesn't have the right to intervene for moral and ethical considerations. Um, obviously I've been in law for 30 years now at this point in time, written any number of things. And so, of course, I'm going to choose to speak on neither one of those things tonight, <laughs> today. Because the one thing that being in the law has brought home to me after a number of decades of thinking about this, and remember I'm a law professor, that's, I'm paid to think about things. That's all. I don't put test tubes together. I just get to think about things. It's a great job. Um, harass students sometimes, but that, that's another one. Um, and before you get to law, you have to have the ethics. All law is based upon ethics or a compromise of ethics. And I think that we are not yet there. I think we do need more law, but maybe not more regulation, but that we're not there yet. I'm not in any position to propose what that might be, and I certainly don't think society is in that position to do that. This conference itself is but a first step in the dialogue, and a number of people have, have discussed that point, that we, we haven't thought this through yet. Well, where are we? And what is somewhat unique about where we are? Um, I, uh, somebody disparaged uh, a, a comment earlier, but I, I do think that we can assert that we are the gods. Not God in the formal theistic sense, but gods like Roman gods, Greek gods, sort of bumbling gods. Uh, lots of power, not too much sense of what to do with it. You know, they stand around and throw lightning at each other and hold orgies. Um, Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Um, we are the gods in two very important points in, in this point of human history. First of all, we have the power to destroy. And we are destroying right now. We're destroying fisheries, we're destroying oceans, we're destroying uh, rainforests, we're destroying extraordinary amounts of this wonderful planet. We're doing things that couldn't have been done 50, 100 years ago. How do we think about that? How do we get control over that? What do we think about that? Can, we con can those that think about it control those that are doing it? That may be the major disconnect. On the other side, besides the power of destruction, we have the power of creation now that we did not have any time in human history. 
And that's what genetics brings us to. This is as awesome a responsibility as the power of destruction is. We now understand where life comes from. And what are we going to do with that knowledge? How do we assimilate that information? What are these other beings? What have they been all along in our journey through time? And what about these new beings that we're creating? What do we think about that? What's a good paradigm to consider what we think about these animals? Well, I think there's, there's two issues um, that I have had to face over time. The first one was, for me, the very easy one, and that is, do we have any ethical duty to animals at all? Should I think about animals in an ethical context? Do I worry about them and the consequences of my actions to animals? That I answered 30 years ago with a, of course. I don't know why I came to that conclusion at that point in time, but I did it. And a number of other people have done that as well. That's a holistic judgment. I just looked at the world around me and said, yes, I should take into account these animals. Now, much more difficult than that which has taken me some 30 years of pondering is, well, what should be the scope of that duty? How do I define that duty? What would that duty mean? What are the boundaries of that duty? Are there boundaries to that duty? And this, I think, is, is something that's uh, extremely complex. When we come to the issue of um, DNA, it adds, this, it adds to this complexity. We've only known about DNA as a species for about 50 years or so. That's a blink of time, right? How much time is 50 years in human history? Nothing. Yet science is just accelerating the information about that information. They're building upon it. And all of a sudden now, not only do we understand that DNA is the driving force for creation of beings, but that we now can talk about the actual sequence, the molecule itself of life. And now we're dividing up those molecules in little segments, and we're saying, this segment will do this. And this segment does this. And this. I mean, that is extraordinary power. And now we're going to take this segment from over here, and we're going to stick it over here into another being. That's creation of new life. Sometimes the change is very modest, but I think, obviously, the risk is that the change can be significant. And at the moment, I don't think we've assimilated the ethical consequences of DNA. That the chimpanzee's DNA is just like yours. Same basic molecule, a couple of variations in sequence, in expression. What does that tell us about the ethical obligations? If we have ethical obligations to each other, why don't we have ethical obligations to chimpanzees? I think we do because we're all living beings driven by the same molecular life force here on this planet. But to say that you have the duty doesn't answer the question, well, what's the scope or nature of that duty? It's, it's uh, on the other side of, I teach international environmental law. Um, in my mind, to now say that we don't have global warming is ridiculous. To say what we should do about global warming is extraordinarily difficult. But you can't deny the fact. We have the DNA. You can't deny the fact. Now, what is the consequence of the fact? What flows from that? The public, I think, isn't there yet either. And it's not unlike nuclear power has been for a period of time. It's something most people don't understand, don't want to deal with, and have a sort of automatic negative reflex to. So we're against nuclear power. Well, why? Well, it's dangerous. Why? Under what circumstances? Uh, it's, it's a lack of basic information uh, held by the public to understand nuclear power. Same thing with DNA. What do you think of genetic animals, modifications? So easy, as we saw in a number of the slides, to come up with horror stories involved. Um, but I don't think that's very useful uh, in a rational discussion. And we need a rational discussion. It can't be an emotional discussion. We have facts. We haven't yet assimilated in what we do. Well, one of the things I want to do in the next few minutes is, is to give you 
the end result of my, like Steve has his history of thinking about things, I've had my history of thinking about things, and I, I, I'm coming at a different place, uh, although Steve and I agree on many points, our paths aren't necessarily the same. Um, I think that it is, all, it is acceptable for humans to use animals for their own benefit, but only in the context of respect for their inherent beingness. The use is there, but it has to be in the context of respect. All right? Now, that's, a, that's not a legal word, is it? You're not going to have a regulation that says, and you must respect the animals. That's, that's not going to work for us lawyers. But I think we all know what the word respect means and how it might apply to other beings. But inherent beingness, I think, is a phrase that maybe you, you haven't heard before. And I think that that's very critical to talk about moral obligations towards animals. Sheep have a beingness. Chickens have a beingness. I've now had chickens for three years. And, I, and a chicken's beingness is a rather limited repertoire. <laughs> but it's rich. And if you, if you haven't lived with a chicken, you don't understand what that beingness is. It's, it's marvelous. Their life can be a very nice life if they're given certain parameters. And if I've learned anything about chickens in the last three years, for example, it's that if you put them in a battery cage, you've destroyed their beingness. There is no way a chicken in a battery cage has the capacity, has a physical capacity to express its beingness in that circumstance. And I think anybody who sees chickens and understands that and would accept my approach to making a judgment about things would have to say, that's a ban, I'm sorry. I don't think any chicken should spend any one more moment in a battery cage, period. Chimpanzees have complex beingness approaching ours, much more complex than a chicken. And our ethical duties correspond to their beingness. You have more of a duty the more complex their beingness is. We have a regulation that allows people to keep chimpanzees in five by five by five cages. That's a battery cage for a chimpanzee. I think that's morally unacceptable, period. We don't need to go any further. Now as to genetically modified animals, you can see that my concern is, are you tinkering with their beingness? Are you changing the nature of the animal? Okay. And I've come up with seven points or principles that I'm willing to use to judge whether or not some genetic activity is acceptable or unacceptable. First one. The genetic manipulation shall not, shall not produce animals which are incapable of natural reproduction. Not capable of natural reproduction. Do you modify the animal to such an extent that it no longer can make its own next generation? Now, I'm not saying that you can't use artificial methods of producing a next generation. It's whether you have changed the, the, genetic manipula of, uh, the genetic code of the animal to such a degree that they can't do it anymore. And my uh, little foray into turkeydom this year is I've picked up some information suggesting that the standard turkey that is bought by most people, the butterball turkey in the grocery store, that turkey no longer is capable of reproducing itself on its own. It takes human intervention at all levels to create the next generation. And I think that is wrong. That is pushing an animal in a disrespectful beyond a boundary of appropriate activity. Second one, genetic manipulation shall not increase the capacity for an animal to feel pain or eliminate the capacity to feel pain or increase suffering. Pain is an inherent part and perhaps the most fundamental part of our neurological system. When we created, when we created, when, when nature created vertebrate species, the pain signal was one of the first parts of that that was, that was inherent in it. If you have interfered with an animal to such a degree that you are interfering with that capacity to feel pain, 
or in creating more pain, then I think that that, again, is an outside parameter over which I would not want to, to say is appropriate. Third one, any genetic manipulation shall respect the natural form and beauty of the species of the parent stock. I don't want six-legged snakes. don't want all these weird creatures that we see there. Um, and I don't want a regulation that says it has to respect the beauty, as I don't really think I want regulators trying to figure out what beauty is. But I will tell you that I think that when you look at individual animals of a species, you will see the ones that are the wow species, the individuals, the beautiful ones of that species, the beautiful parrot, the beautiful bull, the beautiful chicken, are the consummate positive examples of that species. And that's what we want to keep in mind if we're going to do any manipulation, so that we don't do that, interfere with that. Number four, should be pretty obvious, but uh, nobody's ever said it, uh, shall not decrease the intelligence of the animal. Animals do have intelligence. All of us that have pets understood that, I think, at one level, but uh, all animals have intelligence. They all have capacities to interact with the world around them, and we should not diminish that capacity. We should respect that capacity. If you're a science fiction reader, uh, David Brin had the Uplift series that talked all about uh, how the chimpanzees and dolphins were increased in intelligence to join us uh, on this earth. Number five, we shall not mix genes from different species unless it is highly probable that the outcome will be stable beings with a good quality of life. I think that should be pretty obvious. We don't, and I don't think most people want to create bad beings, but, but let's, let's be focused upon that. As uh, how, how, do you, how do you get that probability that the stable beings will have a good quality of life? That I'm, I want to talk about. I'm not sure. I do know that some of the initial experimentation that's gone on here I, I have some difficulties with because it doesn't seem like there's a very good probability of a positive outcome. Number six. Genetic engineering should not be solely for novelty and entertainment because I think that that's an insufficient motivation to show respect for the animal. Novelty and entertainment puts you in the category of consumerism and pop culture and, oh, isn't that cute? And, yes, let's have zebrafish that glow. I, I would not have allowed zebrafish that glow. There is no need in this world for zebrafish that glow except for people to buy it on impulse and put them in a tank and then ignore them and they probably will die fairly soon thereafter because they really don't care. It was just a novelty. So I think we need more than just commercial sales as a reason to engage in this process. Number seven, shall not occur without evaluating what would happen if the being escapes human control and moves into the natural environment. That I think also is actually one that most people would accept, that you have to be aware of and the, the consequences of escapes. And while many of the mammals that we're talking about, we don't really see much risk of escape, um, it is there. But clearly the fish represent a species that if you genetically modify it, uh, they will escape. I don't, there's no way to tell me you're going to keep 100% of the salmon in those cages. Now. These are just principles for discussion. And uh, I have some copies of it I brought with me, and I would uh, urge you to, to, if you want to take some back and think about it and reflect upon it, I'd be happy to hear what you might say and, and, re and uh, give me some feedback on this. I've, I thought about my principles when we were receiving the presentations yesterday about the commercial products that were being made. And um, I don't think I frankly would be interfering too much with that level of activity. Um, cloning, while there may be some difficulties about the process of cloning and the risk that that represents to the beings that don't make it, a cloned animal has the same beingness as the parent because it is the same as the parent. So I don't, there's nothing wrong with cloning from, from the perspective of the principles I've developed. Um, the idea of expressions of pharmaceuticals in the milk of a animal. Uh, again, I, in what I saw up there, I didn't see anything to suggest to me that the beingness of those animals were going to be negatively interfered with that, with that process. 
that a new molecule is going to be found in the milk, um, and unless there's things I don't, I'm not aware of, you know, has it, does it increase pain or suffering? Is it reduced intelligence? Has it done the other things? As near as I can tell so far, they do not. Um, the salmon growth gene, I got some environmental concerns about, but since it is the salmon's gene and it's simply an acceleration of a hormone that's already naturally present, it doesn't bother me uh, nearly as much as I thought it would do. The one that does bother me is the animal disease models that are being developed, because I do feel like a number of those have inherently in them increased suffering. And I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not sure how to deal with that, but that I think is, is something that requires much more consideration than simply to create a model uh, without understanding the amount of suffering that's involved. Um, I'd like to just touch upon a second topic, the patent topic. Um, the justice gave such a good explanation of the patent law that I'm, I'm just going to move from that to, to my comments and say that I, I object to patenting of life forms now. I think it's a bad public policy. I think that we need to debate that in the United States. We, we haven't had that debate. The U.S. Congress has not said that we should patent animals. It has not said that. We're making these legalistic arguments. We're building on things. And, and one case in the U.S. that deals with bacteria and we have a patent board that says you can do mammals. Where did that come from? How can you get from single cell bacteria to complex mammals and say that, well, that's just one and the same? It's not one and the same. I refuse to believe that. So we haven't had a debate yet. I, it, I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, it seems like maybe the economic interests don't want Do I want Congress debating this? Oh, I get a headache just thinking about it. <laughs> The sound bites that could come out. I mean, I'm not sure Congress has remembered how to debate anything at this point in time. So w where are we going to have that debate? I, I don't know, but we need to have that debate. Is it respectful of animals to patent them? No, I don't think so. I think it trivializes animal. It makes them, I want to move animals towards guardianship, towards respect, towards being concerned about the individual animal. And I think patenting moves you in the other direction. You're a product. You're a thing. You're a profit. And if you're a prophet, your well-being is not going to be very well taken into account. So I'd be happy to argue anytime anybody wants to hold a forum against the patenting of, of higher life forms. Um, also, as the justice suggested, it really makes no sense to have this in the area of property law. And I, I'm a professor of property law. I teach this. It, it creates disconnects between what we have expected about the ownership of things for a millennium. And all of a sudden, you're going to say that you don't own something that you're holding in your hand and that you didn't buy from somebody, and they're going to come over and say, well, that's mine because the genes in it say, I have a patent on the genes, and therefore you can't have this thing. And they say, but, but I got this thing. It came out of my ground. What do you mean it's not mine? Of course it's mine. I think it's a very bad disconnect from a property uh, point of view. Well. Lots of things to think about. Um, I, uh, I take some, I'll take a little bit of credit for today's event in the sense that it was a year and a half ago that the people in the animal committee <laughs> kicked around, why don't we do a conference? And I was the one that came up with the idea of focusing on genetic engineering because I thought it was a topic that we hadn't yet had good discussions about. And uh, lots of people had to come together to make this happen, uh, but I sort of I started the, the ball down the hill, and I'm very pleased with where it got. I think there's a lot of marvelous people in this room, and, and hopefully we will be able to build from this and move forward. Thank you all. We will now take our final questions with respect to uh, this panel. And in formulating them, let me just suggest this. Uh, David Favor. Uh, brought up for a moment the comparison of human beings to the old Greek and Roman gods. I'd like you to rethink that in the old Hindu context where you had three basic sets of gods. Krishna, the creator, Vishnu, the sustainer. Uh, I'm sorry, Krishna, the uh, destroyer, Vishnu, the sustainer. Krishna, the creator, Vishnu, the sustainer and Shiva the destroyer. In some ways that exemplifies the human experience because ever since the death of the dodo and 
the passenger pigeon. Human beings have indeed been destroying species. With the Endangered Species Act, human beings have been attempting to sustain species, and with the advent of genetic engineering, we're on the verge of being able to create species. Now let's apply that to rules, law, and concepts. That is, what are the issues for the future that we want to create in terms of new rules and regulations and ways of thinking of things? What are the ideas that have worked in the past that we want to sustain? And what are those unworkable and disadvantageous ideas, rules, and regulations that we want to destroy and set aside? So if that assists in formulating questions, I'll be happy to take those. I think we have enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way they're supposed to do. Uh, I'll just oh, oh do you have them? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I'll take those. Wait a minute. I want to read them first. <laughs> okay. I'll go first with Stephen Wise. How would you respond to the statement, if the line between lower and higher life forms is inde indefensible and uh, destructive, so too is the line between human beings and other higher forms? How would you respond to that? That came from the Harvard College case in Canada? That's right. Yeah, well, that was, by the way, one amazing decision. I'm sorry I didn't get to hear the justice speak about it, but it, as, as I told him, I. Uh, um, I teach it in my classes. I, I have been since it came down. And uh, we spend at least a good hour on that case alone. And in it, uh, it raises uh, more philosophical questions than I've ever seen in any judicial decision in, in, in my life. And I, I, I enjoy watching the interplay between the dissent and the majority. And it's, an, it's extraordinary. Uh, that is a statement, I think, from the majority. And uh, uh, I, the answer is, um, uh, I can't remember the exact question, <laughs> but uh, uh, the answer is I don't think there is a difference. I, I think that is a correct statement. I feel like I'm on a game show. It is a correct statement. <laughs> it's, uh, um, we've got a question really directed to Jeannie Perrin, uh, and specifically FDA would like to make two small clarifications regarding its jurisdiction over Please genetically <laughs> engineered animals. Would, would you discuss that? Uh, no, well, them. <laughs> no, uh, Larissa, go, please. Yes. May I please? Um, we, we just want to let everybody know that although FDA is currently operating under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic rubric of a new animal uh, that we're regulating genetically engineered animals under the new animal drug rubric of FFDCA, and point of fact, no formal decision has yet been made and the, this discussion is still being held across the U.S. government. So Jeannie is, and all the other attorneys who talked about the, the law and the act are absolutely correct. We're still talking with USDA. We're still talking across the U.S. government to figure out the best way to do this. And can you and tell us who, who, which agencies and which persons are actually talking this over? Who will actually make those decisions? Uh, <laughs> people there who get bigger salaries than <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, it's happening at the very highest levels. And we're hopeful that there will be a decision soon. But at the moment, please understand, even though we're operating under that paradigm, um, that no formal decision has been made. Secondly, were that decision to be made, and FDA to regulate genetically engineered animals under the new animal drug rubric, the construct would be the new animal drug, not the animal. The animal would contain an article that alters its structure or function. And so therefore, don't, don't think of it really as a drug. Think of it as an article that alters the structure or function of the animal. So I know it's terribly confusing, and I know it's the end of the conference, but I do have two aspirin left. So if it gives you a headache, that, uh, I'm happy to share them. Thank you very much, Larissa. We've got a question here, and thank you. Uh, for professors wise and favor, would you agree, and this is directed to both of you, would you agree that there is a fundamental and unique difference between humans and animals, or disagree? Um, that's it. I have no idea what person means by fundamental. Um, whatever differences there are, I don't think they justify a disregarding of the <coughs> acknowledgement that animals have interest uh, and that we ought to be aware of those. And you? Every species of, species of animal is unique. All right. 
And this is directed to Dr. Perrin by someone who's looking, uh, uh, looking there to find a definite way towards the future. Is there a map posted <laughs> anywhere uh, on who has jurisdiction over what specific animal issues? 10 years it took me. <laughs> so the answer is really no. Um, it's, it's walking through the act and, and the regulations and trying to figure it out. And just to let you know, uh, my mentor is a guy who's been doing it for 40 years. I call him the grandfather of animal food and drug law because he's been doing it longer than anybody. And I actually had to call and ask him a question about one of my slides this morning. So, um, so unfortunately, no. Um, it's just something that you have to learn. But that would be nice, Larissa. I think you should put that on the FDA website. What do you think? Okay. And another question for Dr. Perrin. We've heard a lot in the past two days about applications of biotech in the field of farm animals. How would transgenic farm animals produced for food purposes likely be regulated? Well, again, we need the map, but um, the, animal, <laughs> the animal itself is regulated by the FDA while it's growing on the farm into food. The disease in the animal is regulated by the USDA. So theoretically, uh, and again, it's not decided, as Larissa just clarified for us, and I appreciate it, um, but theoretically, assuming FDA does decide to take jurisdiction, then FDA still has jurisdiction over that animal. Theoretically, if it's a cow or a pig or a goat or a sheep, if it walks into a slaughter plant um, and becomes human food, then it's under USDA jurisdiction during that process. And then after that process, it depends on what it's turned into as to who has jurisdiction. So theoretically, um, the, the, the jurisdiction doesn't change even though it's a transgenic animal unless the FDA and the USGA work out some deal that's a little different than what we're expecting them to come out with. Okay, for Dr. Favor, um, you've talked about your seven principles of evaluating potential genetic engineering. Imagine a situation where the Russians uh, or Russian research lab actually takes up some of the old mammoth DNA that's frozen over in Siberia, combines it with elephant DNA and begins actually creating uh, what, at least for appearance purposes, are mammoths. Um, there's potential for enormous research to be done, but there's also the prospect that it's being done for purposes non-respectful of the animals. Um, that is for running essentially, you know, Mesolithic Park or something. Um, <laughs> how do you evaluate that, uh, that clash of interest between research on the one mm -hmm. hand and what you describe as novelty on the other? Well, I'd have to know who's proposing it. If, if it's a Jurassic Park uh, episode, then obviously I'd, I'd be opposed to it because I don't think that's a good motivation. If it's actual scientists that, act, that know something about this and have, in fact, a technology in place that make it reasonably certain they could do it, um, I'd be willing to talk about it. I think that's sort of fascinating. But I don't want pain and suffering as a consequence. All right. With respect to Professor Wise, um, uh, in terms of looking ahead at rules and regulations of the future. Is it more ethical to conduct drug testing on animals when those animals are specifically developed to alleviate animal disease and suffering as opposed to human disease and suffering? Uh, no. And, and I think that uh, uh, it's only, well, let me see. There are animals and there are animals. I, when, when I speak about animal rights, for example, uh, well, actually, I don't speak about animal rights. Uh, the reason is, is that there's an infinite number of rights and there's a million species of animals. So if I'm speaking about uh, a particular issue, I need to know what animal we're talking about and what, po what possible right we're talking about. So when someone asks me, uh, how would I deal with, with an animal, I don't know if you're talking about a chimpanzee or a whale or a fruit fly or a Beetles, so it's really hard for me to answer those kinds of questions. Well, then let's think about it in terms of dogs, for example. If some dogs are being tested for purposes of developing cures for uh, various diseases or, and uh, uh, problems suffered by dogs, hip dysplasia, or uh, any of a number of other things, does that change your perspective that the animals are being used for research to benefit animals as opposed to humans? I don't think it matters. All right. 
Another question for you here. Um, and here someone's trying to obviously set up a clash of our speakers. Uh, do, do you agree with Jeannie that the USDA has teeth in terms of the sanctions it is able to deploy? Why or why not? Uh, well, let me see. <laughs> Uh, no, actually, I, I, I don't think the USDA uh, has teeth. I, I think uh, uh, it has, it has uh, baby teeth. And, and sometimes, uh, it, it, if you tick it off enough, it, it, can, act, it, can, bring, uh, it, it can bring sanctions against, against someone who violates. But I think if you, um, uh, if you staffed it, say, with the lawyers from the Animal Legal Defense Fund, I think uh, you would find that the number of... Uh, of uh, uh, um, penalties and the and, and the amounts that would be assessed against violators would be significantly different than the uh, penalties that are are assessed now. So I think potentially it has teeth, but I think the way it, it operates and has operated, it's relatively toothless. All right. And then I'm going to, in the last minute, I'm going to turn to each of the panelists in this forward-looking conversation and ask each of them uh, what one change they would like to see made for the future of our rules, regulation, and law affecting animals. Mr. Dr. Wise. Well, if <laughs> you make you this one, uh, if this one, then I will die, ha die happy, which is that uh, at least some non-human animals need to be designated as legal persons. Ms. Perrin. Um, I would like to see USDA get a much larger budget and a much larger staff um, so that they as, as an organization are not stressed. It's, I know it's not a regulation, but it, mm. just in terms of practical enforcement of the regulations, I think that would be the best thing we could do for animal welfare. And Professor Favor. I think I'd like to see a law passed to make it clear that you cannot patent animals. I'd like to thank all of these three speakers for presenting some very interesting uh, ideas that can help us guide us into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, nice to meet you. you too. Time to say goodbye. You look in your binder, you won't find an evaluation form, folks. We didn't put one in there. Uh, but we may uh, send you an email asking a couple of questions. Uh, thank you for being non-acrimonious. We worried about it a little bit. Attentive, uh, asking great questions, inquiring, opening, uh, open to us, networking. Thanks to all the speakers, the sponsors. Goodbye. <laughs>